Hey everyone, this is Kelly Matthews with Divine Aggression Radio. This time out, it's my interview with Bruce Swift from Sacred Warrior. The interview was recorded in early October 2013, and the original broadcast was shortly thereafter on Audio Access FM. It was rebroadcast in 2014 on Untuned Radio, and that was very special because Bruce actually came in to the Untuned chat room, hung out with us, got a chance to talk to the fans, and it was really special. It was really awesome. And Sacred Warrior is one of those bands that just played a huge role in the soundtrack of my life. God has used their music and ministry to reach out to me when I really needed it as a teenager, all the way till the present day, till right now. So Sacred Warrior has been such a blessing. Now one cool thing about the version you're about to hear, there are three minutes of unaired interview footage you will not find it anywhere else. It was not in either of the first two airings of the interview. It can only be found right here, and it's at the very end. I hope you enjoy this interview with Bruce Swift from Sacred Warrior. Hey there, this is Bruce Swift with Sacred Warrior. You're listening to Divine Aggression Radio. I have a special guest with me for this episode of Divine Aggression Radio. He's a member of a band who really changed the face of Christian rock and metal in the late 80s and early 90s, and they have a brand new album out in 2013. So welcome to the show, Bruce Swift from Sacred Warrior. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, privilege, and thanks for having me. Okay, let's get right into it. Let's talk about the new album, Waiting in Darkness, because a lot of Warrior fans have been, no pun intended, they've been waiting a long time for this. So what was it, how did it all come about, and uh, just tell me all about the new album. Um, probably began, I'd say, three and a half, uh, close to four years. I don't really keep a close timeline on every detail, but approximately three and a half, four years ago, Steve approached me um, that he had been... Uh, considering recording some new warrior because we had some you know we had a lot of uh interest people were asking and we had taken probably a 15 year break there i think it was or 12 year break whatever and uh um yeah so at that point i was in a band just messing around and i was starting to write heavy again and i hadn't played heavy metal for a while so um i wrote a couple heavier tunes and the guys in the band said that kind of sounds like warrior and it just so happened within the next month that that band just kind of uh, our couple guys got jobs and one guy moved so the band just kind of decided yeah let's we're going to call it quits and it was just more of a fun thing but um so at that point I approached Steve and he had said he felt pretty strong that it was time to do a new warrior CD uh, so that's where it began and um we started writing we had uh uh, I was still writing. I was playing a lot at church. I was playing a lot of acoustic stuff, uh, uh, more edgy stuff. And then the band I was in was more rock. And so I was not in metal shape, so to speak. And my fingers just w were not doing what the, they had done years prior. And so the songs that I had presented to Steve, we just we put down and we started recording. And... Um, and we just started feeling like they're too rock and roll. Right. So at that point, and Ray was a part of the process at this time, and at that point we just, um, I stepped back and started rewriting a lot of the music and started just playing a lot and got my fingers back in shape and started writing metal again. And um, so at that point, um uh, we began to uh, write the CD, and, and then we started getting some calls for shows. Uh, we got an opportunity in Switzerland, in Puerto Rico, uh, in Ohio, just several shows. We probably four or five shows that we we took because, you know, we felt it'd be good for the band to, to get out and play again. And uh, But what that did is ended up taking a lot of time from the recording right? So because we had to start rehearsing again. So that held the CD up, and then uh, um, and then we started recording again. We got back, and we decided we're not going to do any more shows till this thing's done. 
and and then uh, I got sick. Or uh, I, well, excuse me. First, Ray came to us and said that after the CD, he would not be able to continue with the band because of school and um, the commitments he had at work, his new job. And so I went to the band and basically told them that uh, it was in our best interest to move on. Uh, as much as we love Ray as a brother, a friend, and a, and a bandmate, it was time to move on if we were going to continue on. If we were just going to do one CD and call it quits, then we would stick with Ray and have him finish the CD. But we were all pretty convinced we wanted to keep doing this. And and um, so we basically let Ray know we were going to continue on without him. It was nothing personal. It's just time to move on. One thing I was really impressed with, with Ray, I have, I've never actually met him myself, but I've got, I have several friends who, who know him. And I saw a post from him on Facebook, and it was encouraging all the Sacred Warrior fans to stay with the band and to get behind you guys, and uh, how he was just really excited about the new project and uh, how it was great that Eli was a part of the band, and I was thinking to myself, what a stand-up guy yeah. to not be a part of something and then to go back and tell every, encourage everybody to get behind it. Yeah. That was that was really cool. Yeah, and I think with Ray at that point, he was he knew that it was just it wasn't a personal thing, and and it wasn't an attack on him. We would love to have Ray do it. It's just it wasn't in the best interest of us carrying on as a band. And he understood that, and he and and so and then after the band broke up, I'm sorry. After you know we moved on, and he he uh, you know decided to do that. It was probably six, seven months, a year later, probably a year later. He George approached him from Recon to do a song or two for Rick Macias that they had talked about for years, and then wow. it evolved into let's do an album, man. And and you know what I. I don't care who you are. Ray's people are like, hey, man, I don't get it. Ray, you know, he can't do a CD with Warrior, but he can do one with Recon. That wasn't the plan. That was that happened. And I, I'll be honest, man, when you're a musician and you love to do what you do, it's kind of hard to give it up, you know. And he probably had full intentions, and, and it ended up working out. Where And George, I think, does most of the writing, so Ray just had to sing it and uh, I don't think they're going to be a real busy band. I don't know, but I, I think Ray just probably started singing with them, and it was a good vibe, and they thought, let's do a CD. Nothing personal, nothing. Nobody's taking it personal. We feel like God has redirected everybody. We love Ray. Ray's awesome, and there's nothing personal there, and everybody speculates, but it's not. It's just that's how it worked out. Um the bottom line is the direction we're moving to is not, it's a different style of vocals. It's Eli things, you know, a harder core metal and Ray is awesome. Let's face it. But the other side of it is Ray does, you know, has not had a lot of time to continue singing and, and, and stay in shape as far as this kind of vocal approach. And so for him, I think it was a challenge as well. Even live when we played out, it was it was a struggle, and I'm sure he felt like, man, if I'm going to do it at a higher level, uh, I it's hard to do with my job and going to school. So I've I've already I don't know if you've heard any of the tracks from Worldview that he's the project he's doing, but it's a no, good fit for him personally. It's a really good fit because they're it's not like a demanding like he's got to be taking it to that that notch he was at 20 years ago right it's a better fit for him it's it's way less demanding and i think he's very it fits him perfect and it sounds great to me it's just uh, we were going a whole different direction and um so that is kind of kind of how that went about so hats off to him god bless him we want nothing but the best and actually i can't wait to hear his cd at that point when ray had um uh, you know, we decided to move on, you know, and and uh, audition another vocalist. Uh, we probably had five guys that uh, sent auditions, and and uh, hands down, we decided on Eli. Number one is, is spiritually his heart, and and uh, number two is his vocals. Obviously, we really felt like he fit the direction we're heading. And 
much heavier direction, and still he can mimic Ray well. He doesn't sound like Ray, but he mimics Ray well. And uh, obviously uh, um, he can he can pull off the old Sacred Warrior uh, well enough to obviously make it sound good. So uh, so we decided to, to go with Eli. Well, at that point, um, it began kind of a... Um, a unique time for us as far as challenges because I uh, had a hip replacement several years prior and found out that it had gotten infected. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I had to go through the process of getting a hip replacement with a spacer, which is about a six-month process of recovery. So in in that process, I had to step back from obviously recording uh, for six months, and uh, and yet provided a, an incredible opportunity for me to continue writing because we are still needed material, lyrics, and in that six months when probably 70% of the CD was finished um, in my recovery. Um, and then during that recovery, Joe Pettit, the keyboard player, found out he needed a tra- heart transplant. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, when we got back from uh, Switzerland, he found out his heart was failing. And um, so he got a heart transplant. I got a new hip, and then during that process, Tony Velasquez found out his heart was failing. Are you kidding? No, oh, and he found out he had a uh, clogged you know, uh, valve, so he had to have a stent put in or stent, whatever they call them. Mm-hmm. He had to have that put in. And he's doing great now. So all in the same year, the three of us were physically challenged at, at, and incredibly challenged. So um, so obviously that held the CD up. And a lot of people are like, the CD's never going to get done. And at that point, we were pretty um, pretty discouraged as far as like, wow, what is the, what's the deal here? And I remember talking to Tony on the telephone um, when I was sitting on my couch recovering, and Tony was in the hospital, not doing very well. He was at his heart was running at ten percent. Wow. That's how sick he was. So, um, yeah, I just remember talking to him and saying, you know, Punky, if it's time to go be at the Lord, it's time. And just so inspiring to me that you know this guy loves the Lord, even you know within, uh, you know, 10% of his heartbeat from God. Right. And uh, it was so encouraging to me sitting there because, and I was like, Lord, what are you doing with us? What do you want? Because it, this is not normal that three guys within the same band are suffering incredible adversity. And um, and through that came the CD. Personally, that was for me the turning point for us. Eli really was an awesome, uh, just, uh, he was just, he brought a lot of stability to the band, you know, just right. his confidence and his encouragement just during those trials. And here's a guy who gets into the band, and I remember all of us told him, dude, <laughs> watch your back, man, because <laughs> right now the Lord's definitely challenging us and testing us with our physical, you know, physical, uh, you know, uh, adversity and and he, the whole time, just was, you know, had a good uh, sense of humor about it, but also prayer. And, and yeah, so through them, that incre- incredible uh, time there, we, uh, I mean, the lyrics from the CD really were shaped. And I think of Desperately, uh, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of In Dust and Ashes right now. I wrote that uh, lyrically uh, one night I woke up. And I had just started walking barely again with crutches, and I went down into my basement, and I basically read the entire book of Job, uh, all but a few chapters, and I wrote In Dust and Ashes, and that's what that song came out of. Uh, uh, but also, I felt like it was our heart's cry at the same time. Right. Uh, so that, and then uh, just uh, obviously... Uh, uh, Jealous Love, and I wrote Desperately Wicked in that time, and it just, everything came out of that season, and God allowed it, and and it was just an incredible time, and I tell people now that, 
you know, for six months I was incredibly challenged, but I found it to be the most, one of the most satisfying times of my life because I literally could only sit for months, six months. And so when you sit a lot, you I mean, you have nothing else you can really do. You actually rest. And I would read and I would play my guitar. That's all I could really do. One thing you guys did, which I thought was an absolutely brilliant move, on the new album, you took one of your uh, Sacred Warrior classics, if you will, and you re-recorded it, and to me, it tied the new album in with uh, what the band did back in the late 80s, early 90s. What made you choose uh, the Temples on Fire for the re-record? Actually, we did two. We did Day of the Lord and Temples on Fire. Oh, okay. Day of the Lord is off a of rebellion. Okay. So that one was the other one. Eli really liked Day of the Lord. That's one of his favorite songs. And so we, you know, wanted to, you know, give him, you know, we asked him what song he would like to do, and he chose that one for this CD. And then Temples on Fire is just, uh, it's always been one of our favorites as far as live. It's just got a lot of energy, and it just really is our hearts cry, that man. Yeah. The temple, our bodies, obviously, this temple, the bodies we live in uh, are on fire for God, man, and that's our heart's cry, man, through metal, that we are going to sing through metal music and, and proclaim this incredible gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, our temple's on fire, and this temple's on fire. And uh, and we just felt like that is a that was one of Ray's songs, that, that that's a killer vocal uh, lyrically and, and just his whole vocal approach. And we, that was one of the audition songs that Eli, we sent to him to see how, number one was Waiting in Darkness. That was the first song. We sent him them tracks and um, I said, sing this and send it back and then sing Temples on Fire and send it back. Because if you can sing Temples on Fire and Waiting in Darkness, then we know you can do this. And and he killed it. I mean, when, I remember when I heard Waiting in Darkness, I had tears coming down my eyes i was ecstatic i was like oh my god i mean i be honest with you i was quite nervous like how are we going to replace ray it's not going to be easy but i knew in my heart it was time to move on i just knew it and um and i was like and i know steve was like are you crazy you know and but we finally came to terms with it was time to move on that that it it was over and so when I heard that song, I was floored, and and then he he sent us Temples on Fire, and I went, man, this guy's the guy. It's just he nailed it. It obviously it doesn't sound just like Ray, and we didn't want that, but he mimics Ray well and does a very good job. And um, so that was one of the audition songs. So that's why we put it on there. It was just he was familiar with it and felt like he did a great job on it. You guys, had, I guess it was you guys had put a, a video up on YouTube. Yeah. Of, of the title track, and I saw it on Facebook, and I was just like, oh my gosh, New Warrior, and I went right over to YouTube and watched it, and was blown away, and like the cat who ate the cheese and sat next to the mouse hole with bated breath, I had been waiting for the album to come out, yeah. and uh, and, and it's it's great, it was, it was definitely not a disappointment, because you know, you have some bands who take a hiatus, and they come back, and they're just, they're not what they were in their former you know, the former lifetime of the band. But yeah. you guys, just like you've taken a step forward, and that's another reason I wanted to talk to you and do this interview is to let people know how awesome this new album is. And uh, now I well, do want I appreciate that, and we appreciate that as a band, and that's how this thing's going to get get uh, wings to fly, so to speak, is, is just God leading people to, you know, to it. And that's the bottom line. And, and uh, um yeah, so it's it, we're we're very grateful for the CD because it's it turned out it it exceeded our expectations. I'll put it to you that way. But I'm going to tell you it. I can't even begin to describe to you how difficult it was to get it. To the and there's still flaws. Let's face the facts. It's it's a there's some flaws and there's stuff I know we could have done better, different, but. You know what? I look at it as a whole and say I'm very, very encouraged that it, the way it turned out. And uh, and I mean, we did the whole dang thing. We, it was produced and um, produced and uh, mastered by Sigur Warrior. And 
uh, Steve is incredibly talented at uh, at this stuff, and um, and as a team, as a band, we you know we work very well together. And by God's grace, we got this this CD. So. Well, I think it's it's awesome, and it's a great addition to the uh, the Warrior catalog. And speaking as a fan, um, I know uh, Obsessions the recording uh, quality wasn't up to what you guys really wanted. But musically, I have to tell you, when I was, uh, let's see, how old was I? I was a teenager <laughs> when that album came out. I lived and breathed musically, Obsessions, yeah. for like months. Um, when I would come home and I'd sit down, the first thing I would stick in my tape player, not CD, but tape player, would be Obsessions from Sacred Warrior. And I just, it really had a huge influence uh, on my life. So one of the cool things about being a, a DJ and doing shows like this is I do get to talk to some of the people that really influenced me in my life. So I do want to take this opportunity to say thank you for being a willing vessel of the Lord because you did minister to my life you know, in a time when I actually really needed it. So from me to you, not DJ to musician, but from brother in Christ to brother in Christ, thank you. Yeah, and I'm I'm honored. I really that's why I live and um and breathe and move and have my being is to honor the Lord and, and I said when I confessed my allegiance to Christ at eighteen years old, I said, Lord, I'll play for you. I desire not to be a rock star, I desire not to sell albums and be on the radio and I don't know, be the vague Christian guy who talks about love and all those great things, but never mentions the name, just didn't have a, a, a desire for that. Now, some guys do that and that's their deal. Not, I just can't, uh, I am driven to proclaim the gospel, driven to proclaim his message. I feel like uh, I think of um, the scripture that says, "How beautiful are the feet on the feet on the mountains who proclaim the good news." And it um, that's that's my my honor and my job for the Lord. So it's a privilege, and and you know what? I'm just grateful that we're able to do it again. And I think uh, uh, waiting in darkness is lyrically our best work. Um, Musically, our best work. Uh, although I love Obsessions as well, I'm just disappointed with the sonics of it. Right. Um, and that was uh, quite a bit out of our that was out of our control. We would have not allowed that or had that if we would have had more say. And right. Uh, uh, the record company pretty much insisted it it go to you know print and before we could really correct mm-hmm. some things. But right. um, with that being said, it is what it is. And and uh, that's why I look forward to hopefully doing several more uh, CDs with Warrior. Um, yeah, we're already in beginning stages of the next CD uh, writing and uh, just did some rough uh, tracking for a new song. And uh, so we're, we're uh, geared up for the next one. And so uh, excited. All right, let me ask you a question about... Um Back when Sacred Warrior first started, Christian metal, uh, hard rock and metal, was really a new genre in yeah. the in the mid '80s. What um, did you face any sort of backlash from people not understanding what you were how you were trying to present the gospel? Um, Rex Carroll from White Cross said he was told they were trying to move the ark on a cart. Uh, trying to move the you know the Ark of the Covenant on a cart and basically saying that it was not an appropriate way to uh, spread the gospel. Rock and roll wasn't. Did you? How much of that did you face, and how did you deal with it? Uh, we faced it all the time, but it didn't affect us. It and you know I remember back at that point. Uh, I don't know if you remember Jimmy Swaggart. Yes, he did a um, whole. I believe week episode on why rock and roll was from the devil and wolf in gonna... chief's clothing or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and I remember saying, Lord, I'm going to watch this because if I'm doing something wrong here, I want to know. 
Right. You got to understand, I came out of a metal band prior to Sacred War that was in drugs and and groupies, and um, we were in the heart and the thick of just world man and metal and Metallica and Queensryche and Sabbath and and I'm working on a painting job and somebody shares the gospel of Jesus Christ with me and I'm working in a funeral home on dead people and the only question on my mind every day is what happens when you die and the guy I was working for is a Christian and I didn't know that because I didn't know what a Christian really was at that point I spent 18 years living for myself and raised not to really honor God so when I found out that Jesus Christ had a plan for my life and that ultimately I would stand before him when I die, and apart from the blood of Christ, there was no remission of sins, I would uh, spend an eternity separate from God. And you know what? I just was not, I, I wasn't comfortable with that. I was like, if there is a God and there's a Christ, I want to know and I want to commit my allegiance. And so uh, I asked, what's the next steps? And so I went home, thought about it, and came back the next day and I prayed and received Christ and I confessed Christ and said I will follow you and so at that point um, I began I was radically transformed and um, a bomb went off in my heart I knew that uh, I had been saved I had been touched and I just I went after the Lord started Bible studies but I didn't stop playing my guitar the way I played my guitar. It wasn't like, ooh, that's a sinful chord. Ooh, <laughs> that approach is sinful. That's too loud on the amp. That's sinful. You know, that's nonsense. That's legalism, man. That is the I, I read in the Psalms all the time that says, crash the cymbals, make a loud noise unto the Lord. And I find it fascinating that some people have determined that the loud noise is their version of the loud noise. So I really don't take it too personal. I We were picketed. We used to do concerts all over you know, in the United States, and we were picketed. People hold signs up saying our, our music's from the devil. And yet we'd go into clubs, and people would come to know the Lord, and, and we just basically kind of avoided and ignored it. And And guess where we're at today? You know, it's a whole different world. It's people are, you're always going to have your uh, legalists, I call them, those and those who are uncomfortable with it. And I don't want to force it down their throats either, so I just kind of back off. And you know what? They're not going to listen to us, and they're not going to affect me, and, and I'm not going to let them bother me. So it's, you know, be at peace as long as we can, as much as we can, be at peace with each other. If they start attacking me and banging me with a, rot or something i may have to defend myself but you know it's if somebody wants to hold a sign up and say i'm from the devil that's their business and i don't see that happening too much anymore so i i feel like sacred warrior along with blood good and baron cross and a lot of striper obviously striper i think that we are some of the forerunners to breaking this uh, i don't know what the word is for you know this uh, stereotype of metal music so I'm pretty honored to have been a part of that, and and God has led us to this point, and through all that adversity, and you know what, it's changing, and people I think are recognizing that, hey, these metal guys really do love the Lord, and for me, I've been serving the Lord for 27 years now, and I don't think a person in the universe is going to go, you don't love the Lord because you play metal music. I think people are like, wow, this guy plays metal, and he seriously loves God, so you know what? is what it is and it doesn't really affect me too much. How did you guys get uh originally involved with Frontline and Intense Records? Uh, Cuz it was it was a it's a totally different world now as compared to back then for as far as record labels and uh you know self-promotion and whatnot. So how did you get involved with Frontline? Well, speaking of Rex Carroll, um I don't know how it came about. We were jamming at the point had a little demo out and Rex White Cross invited us to open for them out in Gurney or something. I can't even remember where it was, but they invited us to open for them. So we went out and did like, um, I think, six songs we had down at that point. And um, 
and Caesar Kalinowski was there, the guy who owned Intense Records, or he started his own label. And he saw us, and he, after the show, told us he wanted to sign us. Oh, wow. And we're like, what? And he's like, yeah, I'm starting a record company. I want to sign you guys. So we met with him, and like a bunch of knuckleheads, signed a five-year deal with him, five <laughs> records. And because we were so ecstatic, you know, we were like, oh, we made it. We're going to do a record. And so we signed a five-year instead of being smart about it and getting a lawyer and saying, no, let's do a one-year, two-year and see how it goes. Right. And a five-year, and, and he recorded us, and that was Rebellion. He he uh, recorded us in Gurney, and uh, that was our first CD. And it's actually a really cool time for us. A very, I always say Rebellion's my favorite CD because it was a very exciting time. Uh, I felt like the music was just so... Just us. I just right. at that point, that's just man. We just had our sound. We had our uh, vibe, and just it was awesome. And and so we, uh, you know, we recorded that. And then Caesar came to us and told us that another record company wanted to buy or you know buy the rights to Vengeance and us, which was the guys Frontline in California. Oh yeah. So he sold the he sold us in vengeance to them with the I guess the uh, agreement that he would work for the company and record or produce our second CD and once he uh, all the deal was signed they basically fired him oh my and so we were in route to California to do our CD and they fired Caesar and he called us and said dude, they fired me, don't do the CD, and we're in the studio the first day oh, waiting man. for him like we're Caesar. And so that was really an interesting time because in a lot of ways I, I look back and say, should we have said you were not doing the CD till Caesar's here and and maybe something would have changed, but um, we ended up saying, Caesar, we're here, we're just going to do the CD. They had no producer for us. They said we produce it ourselves with their engineer Honestly, that CD sounds like an unproduced, it just like, we weren't producers at that point. <coughs> we were, uh, we were uh, little puppies, man. And the engineer who was engineering the CD said he had never even, he doesn't even like heavy metal and oh never did a heavy metal CD. So at that point we knew like, oh my God, and you can hear it with all the tones and just the way everything's even structure everything caesar was obviously from rebellion to that i mean it's not a horrible cd don't get me wrong but caesar definitely was a pretty good producer and, mm -hmm. and i always so thought we, the, uh, i always thought the kick drum on master's command sounded really weird yeah very, very well, triggered yeah it was it was that's what the guy used because he didn't know how to get really good metal kicks so <laughs> everything was it was just it, it, dude god is he has just led us through some incredibly interesting times and and he's he knows the plans he has for us. The Bible's very clear that God knows what he's doing and I don't look and go, God, why didn't we I mean we sat I sat in Capitol Records office and they wanted to buy us from Frontline Records. They wanted to take ours and vengeance again, our contracts from them in uh Frontline wouldn't do it. Well, they wanted way too much money and it, it was it was astronomical what they wanted, and then at the end of the day, they said, "Don't worry, you guys will do fine with us." And and so, you know, again, there was a turning point. We sat with the the the, the management from Amy Grant and Phil Keggy and Michael W. Smith flew out to see us and wanted to sign us or Holy Soldier, and they ended up taking Holy Soldier. And again, we went, oh, "What's what's going on? Why can't we seem to get to that next level?" And and then year later we broke up and and guess what i spent 15 years with my family getting to know my wife better healing our relationship and because for the first six years of our relationship we toured and did shows and and we had to work out uh, the, the kinks in our relationship and right. so it's awesome dude it's god knows what he's doing man and and i'm telling you right now my family's way more important than music and that that uh, uh, you know that uh, you know to me is where 
I'm at right now is uh, God has done an incredible thing in my family, and uh, and now Warrior to me is just a bonus. It's it's awesome, and I don't really foresee us touring a lot, doing tons of shows. I see us probably doing spot dates and and taking what we can, you know, seeing which one fits our schedule, seeing which one will work out, and and we'll do some shows here and there, but. For me, I'm excited to just uh, create new music right now. That's the, the for me. I love writing music. I love playing metal. It's just fun. So that's that's the goals. All right, now I'm gonna ask you a question, and I want your uh, complete and total honesty with this, because um, because from where I'm at and what happened with me, I had mixed feelings about the whole thing. But there was a reissue of Rebellion a couple years ago from a record label. Um, how involved were you and the band in that, and what was your feelings on the whole thing, or do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, we were not very involved in it. It was the record company owned the rights to the music, so they could do whatever they wanted, and they, they were kind enough to call us and say, uh, we're going to do a reissue of this CD, and would you like to hear it? And you know, and we heard it, and what else can you do? All they really did is mat- remaster it with some different EQs and right. probably boost the volume a little bit. Um, and Steve, obviously, who is our engineer and producer, was kind of like, eh, not that much better, but oh well, they can do what they want. <laughs> so it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like we had much say in it, no. But uh, but the people at that music company they're awesome um adele and oh yeah and she's really a sweetheart and we have no hard feeling and we don't we're just grateful that that, you know what they're trying to get a a better product because honestly that cd doesn't sound great and um it's okay you know and all of our cds sonically are are compromised they just don't sound great and uh the especially obsessions and wicked generation we didn't have a lot of say, and I'm very disappointed in the outcome of those, but it is what it is. It's it's So for us, anything would hopefully make it better. So, yeah, there wasn't a lot that went into it, and that's why right now Sager Warriors working, and we're doing re-records so we can sonically bring the songs up, hopefully to a better sonic level and, and, um, and capture our sound because... Honestly, the two songs on the CD sound more of what we sound like live than the the old CDs. Um, The old CDs, the guitars are very thin, uh, especially on Obsessions. They're just oversaturated with effects, and and that's not my sound. My sound is live, just massive boogies, so it's not... Uh, it's it's not genuine to who we sound like live. So this CD, that's what we wanted to capture, our sound live right. with our new music. And I feel like we totally accomplished it. So right. Now, you know, it wasn't Adele Meisenheimer who actually put the album out. She just gave the rights over to another company. 